in association with Homecoming Scotland. There is no doubt that Scotland is a country with a strong and visual national identity. But there was a time when things were very different. The banning of tartan and highland dress after the Battle of Culloden left Scotland lacking any clear vision of itself. But in 1822, the occupant of this house, Sir Walter Scott, used an important royal occasion to completely reinvent Scotland's image. The visit of George IV to Edinburgh in 1822 was the first to Scotland by a reigning monarch for almost two centuries. I'm joined here at Abbotsford by historian Vicky Coltman. Well, in August 1822, King George IV makes a three-week visit to Scotland, but in reality he stays close to Edinburgh and its environs. And effectively, it is like a state visit. So there are a series of ceremonials that includes the population welcoming him to the city, the gathering of the clans, and also a military review. And how was George IV received? Well, he was received with, with rapture, so it would seem. Over 300,000 people turned out to gape at their king, which is about a seventh of the entire population of Scotland at this time. What was Scott's involvement in, in this day? Well, Scott knew George IV, and he's often thought of as being a sort of pageant master. So he effectively stage manages them prior to the royal visit and tells them what to wear and what to do and how to receive their king. Prior to this great royal visit, tartans were predominantly regional and didn't necessarily pertain to families. Scott encouraged clans without a tartan to acquire one at the double, thus helping to invent the historical tradition of the clan tartan. There were specific instructions to the clan chiefs in the Highlands that they should attire themselves and their clansmen in their tartans. He writes um, to MacLeod of MacLeod, Highlanders are what he will want to see. And, and some really shrewd commentators actually make the point that um, some of the Highlanders are taking up arms, but no longer to fight against the Hanoverian monarch, but actually to celebrate him in lots of ways. I believe um, Scott didn't wear tartan. He but didn't, no. George IV. <laughs> Yeah. Did. George IV famously did, and this is where you'll hear people talk about the royal visit as a kind of charade or a pantomime. But actually what's really interesting is that George IV only wore tartan once. But if you look at the satires that were produced around the royal visit, he seems to be wearing it all the time, particularly when he meets the 500 society ladies at Holyrood Palace. And he's wearing this incredibly short kilt um, so that the, the women who are meeting him are often blushing or shielding their eyes from, um, from, from the royal meat and two veg, um, so, as not to be, so as not to see quite so much of the king as they might want to. They say, you know, a king hasn't come to Scotland for 170 years and now perhaps they're seeing more of the king than they wish to. And this day changed Scotland in many ways, didn't it? Well, in some ways. I mean, politically, the visit was meaningless. But in terms of ideology, I think it's very important because what's happening now is this idea of the homogenised Scotland, where the highlands and the lowlands sort of melt into each other and really where tartan starts to become this form of national Scottish dress. George IV's visit changed the role of tartan in Scottish culture forever. Later in the programme, I'll be wearing my new tartan to the greatest clan gathering to happen since that day in the 19th century. Scotland is a country full of natural marvels, but it is also a nation whose landscape is dotted with man-made wonders, amazing constructions that have both reshaped the country and revolutionised the world of engineering. MP Charles Kennedy is in his home constituency to rediscover one such groundbreaking landmark. Now, when you think about it, ever since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, Scotland's brilliance in terms of its engineers has given it a global reach way beyond its size. Everything from James Watt's first steam engine to beam me up Scotty and the Starship Enterprise, fact or fiction, Scottishness is associated with industry, and with innovation. From the fourth railway bridge to the Falkirk wheel, from the last great liner to the huge oil rigs in the North Sea, 
examples of engineering ingenuity can be found all over this country. I grew up here, surrounded by this vast, beautiful rural landscape near the town of Fort William in the West Highlands. And yet, you know, even here, there were major civil engineering works, which didn't just change the contours of the Highlands forever, but they changed the course of history as well. The Caledonian Canal is a masterpiece. This waterway stretches for 62 miles, running the entire length of the Great Glen, connecting the east coast of Scotland at Inverness to the west coast at Corpach near Fort William. The canal was created by a man who perhaps more than any other paved the way for Scotland's outstanding reputation in engineering, Thomas Telford. Thomas Telford revolutionised civil engineering. Construction on the canal began in 1803, but the entire project wasn't completed until 1822. The Caledonian Canal has three sets of staircase locks. This one, called Neptune's Staircase, with its eight connected locks, is the biggest, and along its 500 metre long stretch lifts boats up an amazing 20 metres. Do you know something that's funny, actually, when I think about it? To my shame, I've lived here all my life, I've never been up Ben Nevis, but at least one ambition is being achieved. This is the first time I will ever have gone up Neptune staircase in a boat. That's some view, isn't it? It is. It's As an office view, it's not bad. No. Every morning. All seasons of the year. Just gorgeous. Now, that's has just been coming through the basin, as it were, yeah. the very beginning of the Caledonian Canal. We've come through the sea locks behind us there. This, of course, is the railway bridge, which is the, the equally world-famous West Highland Railway Line. Now, is this my Harrison Ford or my Tom Cruise moment? I just don't know. But that is absolutely amazing. It's like sailing into Niagara Falls, isn't it? And that is the bottom of Neptune's staircase. Eight locks, about 90 minutes from start to finish. 11 minutes a lock, and half to three quarters of a million gallons of water moved per lock. That's an awful lot of water in an awful short space of time. Joining me on my journey along the Caledonian Canal is historian Guthrie Hutton. It's always struck me, you know, Guthrie, from childhood onward. I mean, I used to play here, you know, when I was a youngster, under supervision, of course. When you see these gates in action, I mean, it is like the eighth wonder of the modern world. It has been described as the eighth wonder of the world, and it is a truly amazing piece of engineering. I mean, nothing like this had ever been built before. I mean, the, the scale and the vision of the construction is just massive. It wasn't just the Highlands talking about it, was the rest of Scotland talking about it? The rest of Britain was talking about it because this was a, a government-funded project and the first government-funded project of its kind um, and because it overran its initial estimate of the time that it was going to take, people started to uh, mumble about the amount of government money that was being poured into the Highlands of Scotland. It was not built for commercial reasons, it was built for other reasons entirely. The government actually funded huge infrastructure projects in the Highlands in order to stem immigration and to keep people in the Highlands. It's still amazing to think, you know, that this colossus of civil engineering, conceived by the young Thomas Telford at the time, against the backdrop of a Highlands where a clan system was in collapse. Europe, still in the midst of Napoleonic Wars, quite remarkable. He had the imagination to bring hope 
and employment to the people of the Highlands to change the face of the Highlands forever. And 200 years later, it's great to see that it's still bringing employment and it's still bringing people today an awful lot of pleasure. After the break, Kathleen McDermott celebrates a much maligned Scottish trait. I'm red and I'm proud. And the Mickey Tartan will finally become a reality. <laughs>